So good evening, everybody, uh, from wherever you are. A warm welcome from my side uh, to today's event on priorities in the German federal election. The emphasis today is on foreign policy. Um, my name is Andrea Rommele, and I am Dean of Executive Education here at the Hertie School and also Deputy President here at the uh, Hertie School. And this is an event we are doing together with the Open Society Foundations. I see uh, Daniela Schwarzer here already uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the screen. Uh, Dani, a warm welcome also from my side. Great to see you here. It is an event that has been kicked off a couple of weeks ago, and um, it is all around themes and issues concerning the uh, German election, which is a very interesting election uh, uh, this year, uh, and also a in very interesting election year uh, this year, because we have a lineup of state elections. We had the last state election on Sunday in Sachsen-Anhalt, and uh, we are sort of phasing into a campaign uh, summer, where also foreign policy issues will be uh, center stage and uh, my dear colleague Cornelius Adeba will sort of be your host through the uh, through this um, uh, session and also introduce the speakers to you um, let me very um, briefly also share and I know you you have heard about this and a lot of you have also reached out uh, to us here at the Hertie School that our very dear friend and former president Henrik Enderlein passed away uh, a week ago, and this is the first session in executive The first session in executive education uh, since Henrik's death, um, and I'm taking over here for a, a mixture of reasons. Now Andrea is back. Um, that was a oh. technical a bug in, in the transmission, so please continue. Okay, um, so I know if Henrik uh, would still be around, this would definitely be a session he would tune into. Um, uh, so yes, I just want to, you know, want to remember Henrik at this uh, point. And before it gets even more difficult for me, I would like to pass over to Cornelius. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrea. Um, and our thoughts are with Henrik's family um, in these uh, special uh, circumstances. Um, my pleasure is to uh, lead you through this evening. Um, it's uh, a, a discussion uh, to look at the policy positions, the foreign policy positions of the German parties ahead of the election. I'm a fellow at the Herty School um, and outside of Herty School, I'm an independent analyst and consultant um, and very pleased to be leading through this evening. Um, as Andrea said, Open Society Foundation and Herty School are in this corporation um, to bring a bit of uh, discussion uh, into uh, this, the, the Berlin policy scene. Also, uh, the mere presence of Open Society in Berlin is testament to what is going on in Europe, um, but is also testament uh, to the attraction and the importance um, of German positions um, in uh, foreign policy more broadly, and that's why we will look at the different uh, party positions. But before we, we will do that, um, and my, my thanks go to to uh, the speakers, to uh, Daniela Schwarzer as the Executive Director for Europe and Eurasia at Open Society Foundations. Um, she will be uh, the, uh, the scene setter and she will give us her impressions um, uh, to lay out uh, some of the thoughts that we will discuss later uh, with the respective uh, spokespeople of the parties. Um, the idea is that we have a, a bit of a discussion here on the podium, um, but we will also take in your own questions, comments and thoughts uh, in, at a later stage, either through the chat or through the Q&A function. Um, and without further ado, um, Daniela, please set the scene for us. Thank you very much, Cornelius. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for hosting us tonight. Um, and I, I just wish to, to say that I have been a lot uh, in my thoughts over the past days um, with Henrik's family, with you as colleagues at the Hertie School and with all his friends over Europe. And I think the outpouring of uh, condolences of uh, articles on his life and work just show us uh, what a convinced European, what a strongly invested person in the Franco-German relationship he was. And I think we 
we should all bear this in our mind when we think about the future of not only German foreign policy, but from and European policy in general. You'll be greatly missed and he already is so today. Now, I have been asked to set the scene uh, for this conversation uh, between uh, representatives of various parties, and I will try and do so in, in very few minutes. Now, let's first of all look at the coming four years, because that's a regular term in Germany. Uh, a lot of things will happen, and maybe the first notable one for the new government will be the French elections happening in spring uh, of next year. Um, that will be crucial, and I guess tonight we will discuss quite a bit about Franco-German relationships and what both bring to Europe as the two largest countries and those who actually in many ways also in the crises over the past years have uh, more often than not determined the course of things. Also, uh, in that period of, of four years, uh, there will be several very hot and, and pressing topics on the agenda. And I think the one that the next government will have to move uh, most quickly on is the transatlantic agenda. And here, obviously, we are living through a phase uh, that is both an opening, but also a challenge with the Biden administration and our understanding that we now have an opportunity to rebuild transatlantic relations in a better way and put the core topics we have uh, to the transatlantic relationship uh, let me just mention climate change at this moment as I think the one that the two sides of the Atlantic should deal with most quickly, but then there are others, of course, will come to them. I think this is a crucial challenge, not only for Berlin under new political leadership, but also uh, for the European Union as a whole. Why is this so pressing? We have the opening, but midterm elections in the United States uh, will come up after two years of Biden's tenure. And that means that for domestic political reasons in the United States, the window for an ambitious transatlantic agenda may actually be closing quite fast. Um, also, uh, now we've talked about, or I've talked about briefly one big, big partner. There are other major players in the world out there. And I think uh, as we, I just come from mentioning the transatlantic relationship, China, will be a key challenge for the next government. In my view, a challenge that Germany should look at through the prism of European relations, simply because one of the major policy areas that China is important for with us is trade, which is an EU competence. But definitely, uh, Europe should also look to the US. And I would like our participants on the panel tonight to discuss to what extent it is useful uh, and needed to totally align with the United States where Europe should chart its own course, and what are the topics where Europe should, while probably working with the United States, invest a lot and it's into its own capacity to act, some like to call it strategic autonomy or European sovereignty. That brings me to my next point, which I really would like the panelists to discuss. What should our ambition level for the European Union be for the next four years? Where should the German government push the European Union? both as an international player, what should happen so the European Union can defend European interests more effectively in the world and what will it take? And secondly, what needs to be done to consolidate internally what has been built? And we all know that a number of uh, areas are not quite complete. Let us just briefly talk about the Eurozone, I would suggest, but there are other areas where we actually know we need more deep integration in order to be a stronger actor internationally. My final point on the European Union will be a normative one. We have heard so many times that democracy is backsliding worldwide and is doing so in the European Union. How should the next German government tackle this challenge? Uh, we have two concrete examples where European legal action is underway, where politically uh, the, uh, the uh, analysis of the situation and the criticism is out, Poland and Hungary. Should Germany take a leadership, a stronger leadership on this issue together with European partners? And what exactly can Germany do? My final point goes to uh, the way we look at the major global trends in the world. And I would like briefly to pick out two. One is 
we have moved into a world of great power competition and I have mentioned that already when I highlighted the importance for the next government to find a clear line on transatlantic relations, an ambitious line as I think we should, um, but also in the way uh, we need to tackle China. In this world of great power competition, I think that one extra element is of key importance for Germany as a country. And that is that we have moved into a world which think tankers like to call a geo-economic world. It is a world where security and defense interests are very closely intertwined with economic and financial interests, where it is more about the control of flows. Let's take data, let's take finance, trade, and less about territory, though I believe territorial conflicts will not be gone and Germany will have to deal with that as well. But how does Germany need to reshape itself and how should it think about the European Union to be able to deal with that kind of world? Because our own thinking about foreign policy has to be challenged for three reasons. One is more crisis and simultaneous crisis that reach from one policy area into the other a more hostile environment, uh, and this again, not only in terms of traditional kinds of conflicts, but more interference in our own societies, democratic resilience has become a huge issue. And thirdly, shifting power relationships and shifting partnerships. So we have opportunities here. I've mentioned some, but I would like to throw in the Indo-Pacific as an additional one. Joe Biden is looking out for partners in the world, in particular among the democracies, to manage this world in a better way and my question here is again to our panelists how should germany devise its strategy to situate germany and europe in a world of great power competition where so many things are in flux thank you very much thank you very much uh, daniela for laying out so succinctly um, the environment in which german foreign policy is made and for certainly giving uh, us all and in particular the speakers a lot of food for thought speaking of the speakers um, i'm happy to introduce uh, our four panelists for tonight uh, norbert Röttgen, niels schmidt alexander kulitz and hannah neumann um, they are each speakers on foreign affairs or trade for their respective parties, chairpersons of the relevant parliamentary committees. They have experience as federal or state ministers, as company executives, and as independent analysts and consultants. Let me stress this last point because it mirrors my, my own job description. Um, we're very grateful uh, that you have uh, come and uh, come here to explain and to discuss uh, your party's uh, foreign policy positions uh, to this audience. I see questions coming up. You heard what Daniela has laid out in front of you. Um, but the difficulty when discussing German foreign policy usually is that there is so much consensus around. German foreign policy builds on consensus, decades old consensus. Continuity is the magic word, as it seems, in German foreign policy. And I'd like to break this up a little bit uh, by thinking uh, a bit of um, opening questions to each of you. Um, and to get us going, um, I will start with uh, Herr Röttgen. Um, why? Because you is you are the representative of a party which does not have a manifesto for this particular election, which makes me wonder, um, does that mean with the CDU and I can include maybe the CSU, the two parties, does it mean everything will stay the same after the election from cozying up to China, going wobbly on Russia, doing the bare minimum to keep Europe together? Is this your party's program? No, so thank you first for, for inviting me and us and for organizing this, I think, very important debate because I think um, the most important thing we have to do is uh, to try to deal and try to work on answers, I would say, this way uh, on the many questions Daniela Schwarzer has uh, 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 presented tonight. I think this is the most important thing. No, I could say, because we are doing this in such an intensive way, uh, leading the debate, uh, conducting uh, controversy, weighing the arguments, that we need two more weeks. Uh, but it's not the case. It's simply our schedule. We will be there with a the program in a two weeks time, end of June, June 21st. The program, I think, will be there and the, the leadership committees of both CDU and CSU will gather and will pass a convincing, compelling program. 
And how much change will there be in this program? Because if I could listen correctly to Daniela, change is what is needed. Absolutely. We are, so, so I do not share your thesis uh, uh, on, on, on consensus. On the one side, I think it has been a strength of our country that we enjoy a broad foreign policy consensus. And I'm, I, I, I want not to be patronizing towards the Greens, but I'm happy to see that the Greens have been moving over many years uh, to the, I would say, to be a part of the foreign policy consensus. And this is a strength. Now we have six parties or six parliamentary uh, groups within the German Bundestag, and 20% of them, the far left, the far right, do not share this consensus and 80%, we have an 80% consensus. So this is in general, and this is a, a good news. And this is a strength of our country because it's a requirement of leadership that you have a societal acceptance for doing foreign policy. However, I totally agree. It's not that we can build on the consensus because we have fundamental change. Um, geopolitics is fundamentally changing. A, a, an entire uh, a, a great uh, um, a peri historic period, the post-war period, is over. We are living in a, in, a, in a period of the transformation of international relations. We are witnessing for several years already the unraveling of order, uh, new challenges, dangers, and all that. And Germany matters very much to shape new relations, to define our relationships. And so we have to give new answers to fundamentally new questions and have to try to contribute or we have to build on the societal social acceptance for a reorientation uh, in foreign policy, which certainly requires to put in more resources, perhaps to uh, accept more risk uh, uh, and we are very risk averse as a society. Uh, and this is what is ahead of us. And I think we need more debate, uh, make sure that it is a part of our campaign, preserving the consensus, but nevertheless uh, facing the fundamentally new, uh, very difficult questions. That already sounds a bit like a party program, so we, we'll dig deeper into this to hear which, yeah. which risks you are willing to take. But since you mentioned the Greens, uh, I may all turn over to Hannah Neumann. Um, and uh, well, when the, your party co-president uh, traveled to Ukraine recently, um, he suggested uh, that Germany should uh, send defensive weapons uh, to Ukraine, um, which given the criticism he received for that, doesn't seem to be the mainstream consensus of Germany. So I'm wondering whether this is what you meant, Herod, when you said the Greens are moving to the, to the consensus. But uh, on this precise issue of, of arming Ukraine, um, Robert Habeck, he said uh, one should send weapons so that fewer people die, but also that Europe can prove it's sovereign. Um, so that's quite a, a stretch from the situation on the ground to European sovereignty. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the position uh, of the Greens in this particular field, Hannah? Well, I mean, first of all, Robert Habeck, I did something I think we have to do much more often, discuss where and to whom and for what purpose we are delivering weapons. And he did that in a very transparent way. He started a strong and very engaged political debate which we are not having around other arms exports that are much more tricky, like sending submarines to Turkey that may be used against Greece, continuing to send arms to the United Arab Emirates that may be used in Yemen. This all happens to be silently behind closed doors. And therefore, I'm very happy, actually, that Robert Habeck, with his, let's say, contested notion within the Green Party, but also within the German public sphere, did something very important. Let's discuss arms exports transparently and publicly. But I know this was only half of your question, Cornelius. Um, and the other one is, and that is something where Nobad Rotken also said, we see all these new challenges and we may have a consensus, but we may have to move this consensus to meet the challenges that we're looking at. Yeah. And one clearly is democracies that are facing not non-democratic, let's say dictatorial, autocratic regimes that are really trying to test how far they can go. And Ukraine is one of these cases, but surely not the only one. 
and we need to find answers. And sending weapons to Ukraine may be a good answer or may not be a good answer, but for sure here again, we are starting the discussion. And I think there is a fair right of each and every one to defend themselves. So it was actually an effort in, in starting a discussion ahead of the election on German arms exports policies. Is that what this was about? It, it may not have been intentionally the case, but that's what happened. Okay. And as someone who is for much more transparent and stricter arms export control regime, I think we can discuss this every now and then. Okay, um, we can also do that uh, tonight. First, um, Nils Schmidt, um, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Heiko Maas uh, from your party, just recently asked again uh, for overcoming the veto in EU foreign policy. Um, we, uh, as, as the insiders of, of European foreign policy making know, uh, there is the unanimity principle um, and there is no qualified majority vote on European foreign policy. And it's been a long-standing issue um, to overcome this veto, which can blockade any uh, EU decision. Um, but just thinking that uh, Foreign Minister Maas is the third social democratic foreign minister of the past decade, um, and this has still not um, been implemented. Uh, what is the problem uh, in doing this and in, 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 in this way proving, so to say, also Germany's European credentials? Well, the problem is that it's not up to Germany alone to decide uh, on removing uh, the veto uh, possibilities. There must be a consensus among the EU member states, uh, which has not um, uh, been uh, attained uh, yet. Um, but it um, harks back to the idea of European sovereignty. And in this context, um, I fully support Heiko Maas's um, proposal in order to um, fully develop uh, European sovereignty we need a qualified majority um, decisions uh, made in foreign policy as well. Um, and if you look at our party program for this election, which has already been adopted by a party Congress, so uh, you know what we are talking about, um, uh, the idea and the concept of European sovereignty is key to our foreign policy um, platform. And, um, uh, Olaf Scholz, the vice chancellor and the future chancellor of Germany, has put it uh, that way. Our national interest is Europe. And if we talk about um, German foreign policy, we have to talk about European foreign policy. And we have to talk about European sovereignty because it's not only about military or hard security issues. It's also about geo-economical issues like countering economic coercion uh, by third parties, like um, the China challenge, not only in military terms, but also in terms of industrial policy, innovation policy. It's about strengthening the role of the Euro by the, that's why the Corona bond issue by the European Union can only be a first step. I'm allow me, convinced. allow me just to, to stick yeah. to this this issue of, of foreign policy making for once, uh, because if you you mentioned that you've already passed the manifesto. So rather than asking you what went wrong over the past four years where we couldn't get to qualified majority vote or some kind of majority vote in, in foreign policy, what are you proposing? What can can a, an SPD-led government do differently come September uh, to achieve this European foreign? On policy consensus? Well, it depends on the coalition, of course. Uh, we would prefer to uh, form a coalition with the Greens. For evident reasons, there will be another coalition government in Germany. That It's fair to say that this is quite, this is 100% true. <laughs> um, um, Norbert Rusk does not give up hope, but um, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a learned uh, realist and not only in international relations, but, but in, in policy making and doing. Uh, um, so um, I believe that you will see a stronger push for a uh, for European integration, as I termed it in, in, in uh, as I as I said it in terms of European sovereignty, covering all fields uh, of European sovereignty, not only in the military field. And uh, I believe that 
And the China challenge will be on top of the agenda by any coalition government. And the interesting thing about the German foreign policy consensus is that there's also a mounting consensus among major parties that there is a China challenge. And this is due to the push of foreign policy experts like the ones uh, assembled uh, tonight uh, who started a, a debate about uh, Chinese influence not only um, in economic terms but also in technology terms. Uh, so the, the new consensus in German foreign policy independently of the um, coalition um, is that there is a Chinese challenge out, out there we have to tackle with. Um, okay, and we're, we're coming full circle because the, the, the latest incident where the EU was divided on uh, uh, through the, the majority vote or the, the um, veto was uh, a, a China question. Um, and we'll, we'll have to see how um, uh, any future government will, will deal with that. Um, and I, I shall read the SPD manifesto uh, to learn more. Um, Alexander Kulitz, You should, you uh, should. All, 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 all of us should, yeah. Because it's um, going to be the government platform in the future. So take it seriously yeah this is this is still uh, an, uh, a discussion uh, in which we want to to inform everyone um, but yes everyone is free to to follow up with their own reading um, Alexander Kulitz uh, Change through trade has been the FTB's uh, mantra uh, ever since the days of Ostpolitik. Um, how well has that worked on, say, China and Russia? Um, and what would an FTB government do differently after September? Well, I believe the question is quite tricky. Probably we have to reinterpret re the, the question how, change, how trade actually changes foreign policies. Because let's be honest, let's be frank, um, nowadays, mostly, and we've already heard that several times in this debate, um, foreign policy and especially foreign interests are not really pushed by security issues most of the time. So very often it's economic, it's um, economic issues such as sanctions and other e economic means that are actually used as a tool to um, foster your own uh, foreign affairs, your interests. And uh, I think we've seen this all over. We see it all over, especially when you look to China. Um, so China is getting more and more aggressive, most definitely, if you look at the South China Sea and then other issues, but look at how they actually do the diplomacy. If we talk about vaccination diplomacy, if we look at the Belt and Road Initiative, if we look at the 17 plus one strategy, etc. So I think we really have to consider that trade is one of the most powerful tools you can use to actually um, have your own foreign affairs interest being pushed on the global agenda. And um, knowing this, of course, as Germans, we are a very, very powerful force when we come on the economic scheme. We are one of the top countries, uh, economically very strong. So this also gives us in Europe a different quality. We're not very strong in security issues. That's probably the French or even the British. So I think we have to use also our, our economic strength within Europe to use this as a foreign affairs tool. Um, and probably at the moment, we're not quite there yet. So I wouldn't say change through trade, but mm -hmm. very well consider trade to be one of the most important um, tools that we have when it comes to foreign affairs. That's also one of the issues. Trade is a European decision, whereas yes. foreign affairs is still a national question. Most of yes, the but if, if you say that Germany is so strong on trade, I mean, how has that impacted uh, the course that China has taken over the past 20 years? I believe today um, Germany is seen as, as something like a Trojan horse uh, in Europe uh, when it comes to China, like the big Trojan horse, not the smaller ones that vote for China, but the big one in the middle, which you know prevents decisions from being taken. At least some people on the other side of the Atlantic see it this way and are looking forward uh, to the departure uh, of Angela Merkel under, only under this heading. So does it mean change through more robust trade? I mean, what, what actually can, change, can trade do to relationships, to improve relationships? I think one of the key questions in the future is how far do we actually use trade and economy and how do we separate it from, uh, from security questions, from the question that was already raised by Daniela when we talk about the neo-autocratism rising all over, not only from China, of course China has a lot of challenges, but let's, let's be very honest. 
the challenge mainly arises not from trade, it rises from persons, it rises from personalities. And so if, if people change, if governments change, if ideologies change in countries, that's where usually the threat comes from. That's where usually the, this, uh, the dispute comes from, the foreign affairs dispute. So the question is, where are we heading to in the 21st century with all these challenges that we have? Uh, the technologic, technological uh, challenges, ecological challenges, the social challenges, etc. The question is, what are the state leaders in the future? How do they want to tackle these uh, challenges? Do we tackle them together or do we tackle them confrontative and try to sort them out with each other? And that's, I think, the main question that we really have to look at. And now it's, and it's, always it's the question. It's the question we're looking at tonight, because people want so. to know how do, how do parties intend to tackle these questions? Well, um, I will I will raise three issues in, in our discussion now that I like to go by uh, interests, challenges and the procedures. Um, I want to talk about interests first. And since trade was mentioned and um, very uh, uh, well diligently, uh, the pipeline was uh, also raised in the chat. Norbert Röttgen, uh, allow me to ask you, what is Germany's interest in Nord Stream 2? Uh, my view always has been there is no interest. There is an interest, would have been an interest in making sure that Nord Stream 2 uh, is not going to be constructed because it is not about it's the economy or gas supply. It's, I would say, totally and exclusively a political weapon in the hands of the Russian state, of Vladimir Putin, uh, to, be, to, to, to be able to enable himself and Russia to destabilize the entire Ukraine by being able to circumcut uh, 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 Ukraine as a country which he now is dependent on for the gas, for the, the territorial transit of gas. And if there is a second uh, uh, pipeline through the Baltic Sea, he does not, he's not dependent on Ukraine for gas transit. So this makes, this, uh, this uh, uh, changes fundamentally the relationship. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, is not restrained to destabilize only the eastern part of Ukraine, but the entire country. So but Nord Stream 2 has always been a, 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 an extremely ill-advised project and it should uh, not be enough uh, ignored or uh, promoted by any kind of German politics. Um, you're known for this position and you're also uh, known uh, to be uh, a lone uh, caller, uh, at, at least in the government. But how is it possible, if you say that this is so against German interests, how is it possible that successive German governments have invested uh, political stock into this? Uh, what, what is your impression? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not a lone caller on, on this matter. Um, I would say if you ask, if you had a voting in Parliament, uh, I would be very... Uh, 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 there are chances of having a majority for that position. Uh, and within my own party, I think there is, would also be a, perhaps a majority, perhaps we are divided on, on this matter. It is, uh, it is, it could happen uh, because of, um, I would say, mainly interest of our coalition partner, the SPD. It's well known that Gerhard Schröder uh, has become an employee uh, of, of Gazprom and he has been massively lobbying for the project, uh, former foreign ministers, ministers of, for, for the economy and others uh, have made this a, a, an important point uh, in, in the government. But I would say in general, I would not only excuse it with that, in general I would say it is a lack of strategic orientation. What are really German interests in foreign policy? And to reward only a year after the annexation of Crimea, Vladimir Putin, as the author of this illegal act, with such a huge economic project, which turns out to be a, an additional geopolitical weapon in order to further destabilize, being able to further destabilize this country from which he has an, an annexed a, a certain part, which was annexed Crimea, was really a, a, a wrong foreign policy but with major support uh, in different parties. And perhaps it is also a lack of public discussion about these things. I think well, this, uh, it has been brought uh, into existence uh, incrementally, and now it's close to finish, so to the completion. 
and it's already a second pipeline anyway. Uh, Neil Schmidt, yeah. I sense that you want to come in, um, maybe explaining to us why there is an interest in actually having this pipeline, or maybe why it wasn't only the SPD and the former party president um, who are in favor of this? Well, it's, it's definitely not uh, only Gerhard Schröder who sub supports uh, this project. Uh, this would uh, uh, not suffice uh, to to push it uh, through. It was the Merkel government who has already or, or always supported the project. So it it has enjoyed broad support all across uh, the board, with the exception of the Greens, from the very beginning for for different reasons, for geopolitical, but also for energy policy reasons um, and um, I believe that there is some economic sense to this project this cannot be put into doubt now the problem is that circumstances have evolved over time and of course mood has also the mood vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Nord Stream 2 has also changed over time and there was in my view the main mistake uh, by the Merkel government from the very beginning was to consider it a purely commercial project, which is not true. Any energy project, any big energy project has political implications, that's for sure. Um, you, you mentioned in my, that. Sorry. In, my, in my capacity as uh, Minister of Finance of Baden-Württemberg, I was in charge, of, in charge of one of the biggest German energy companies, Energy Baden-Württemberg. We poured millions of taxpayers' money into that. Uh, we changed the strategy. We changed uh, the CEO. And uh, I know that energy policy, even if it's done formally on the company level, has a lot to do with uh, politics. And so um, it, Nord Stream 2 is not a purely commercial project. There is some commercial is. interest in, in it. Yeah. And, um, but the question is: the question was about interests, um, and you, you yeah. said that there, it makes economic sense. Um, Norbert Röttgen has laid out why it is not in Germany's interest. Um, people, for example, in the chat are asking: How is Germany going to compensate uh, Ukraine, um, Poland, other countries uh, which are, are set to suffer from this? Um, this is: Is this something that that the SPD is considering if and when this pipeline is completed and running? Well, you have to uh, uh, define what suffering means. So if you mean by that that they lose transit fees, I must say that there is no natural right either for Ukraine or for Poland that Russian gas will transit through these countries. This is, to me, a very intriguing uh, idea. And in, in the own interest of Ukraine, um, Ukraine in the Ukrainian national economy uh, should be become more independent of transit fees uh, from Russian gas transit because in the end uh, by 2050 this will be all over so you know this is in my view a a very bad argument there are political costs in terms of blackmailing uh, possibilities which we have to mitigate and which we have to deal with there i'm very much in favor of doing much more of um, linking Ukraine and other East European nations to the European uh, gas network. And there might also be room for some compensation. But the idea that for, for eternity, you can count on having transit fees for Russian gas, it seems quite funny to me. You know, this is- that Sounds a bit like- how this is not sounds how a bit like counting some of, of coal uh, production in Germany um, and yeah. phasing yeah. out certain issues. Um, I will I will pass to, to Hannah Neumann um, and, and the view from Europe. Hannah, you're the uh, European parliamentarian uh, from Germany. Um, so it's apt to ask you about uh, Germany's interest in Europe. And uh, also because Daniela raised the issue of reforming the Eurozone. I'd like to ask you, what is Germany's interest in uh, reforming the eurozone, for example, when it comes to euro bonds, uh, when it comes to common debt issuance, uh, the recovery package, which for the first time brought uh, joint European debt. In what way is this in the European interest, according to the Green position? Well, I, I think, and as Mr. Kulitz mentioned, trade 
we clearly see that every policy area that we have moved to the European level is the policy area where we are strong and where we can stand our own grounds, be it against attacks from Trump, for example, on our customs, or be it against attacks from China, as we now have been seen with the Chinese agreement on investment that some individual member states may have pushed, but the European Parliament in the end has clearly put a stop on it. So the, the, the policy areas where we are staying together, make, we are very strong as the European Union. And everything that I think strengthens this European level, especially in this geopolitical power balance, is going to help us. So that means the additional finances, where I think we need to, to, to invest more on the European level, like we had the recovery bonds, like we had the discussion about the euro bonds, um, where with every crisis, somehow we grew together, more together as Europe. But it has to come with strengthening the European institutions and especially the European Parliament. And that is one of the biggest challenges we have at the moment, be it when it comes to foreign policy, working together on foreign policy and defence policy, or be, be it working together on these funds where quite often because member states put money together, they are very reluctant to give the European institutions and especially the European Union, the European Parliament, the power of oversight, of control and of transparency. So that's where I see the biggest challenge in the coming years that all these steps for putting money together to strengthen the European Union always have to come with some kind of parliamentary oversight on the European level. And that is about the European peace facility, where we are talking about the defense and foreign policy area. But that also needs to be the case with the recovery funds, where we have strongly fought for it. When it comes to the migration issues, for example, the European Parliament, again, doesn't have this control. And it's this ambiguous setup that I think is highly problematic. But Cornelius, just allow me one thing on trade. Um, because I. I strongly believe that trade and economy maybe is our strongest power as Germans and as Europeans in this geopolitical setup. We will never be the ones with the big weapons, um, but we, we have this power potential, but we need to use it. And the way we did it in the past, and I think the example of China is very educative, we gave away all the power that comes with it. Basically, the idea was we'd start trade with China, and that's how we change China. Now we are in a position where especially our German economy is highly dependent on the Chinese market and on resources coming from China. So basically, we are now dependent on China, the ones that we wanted to change and the ones that didn't change a bit. But if we use trade to set standards like we did with the data protection guidelines, where all the companies were against it, and it was like, if European Union does it, Facebook is going, not going to be in the European Union anymore. Now the European Union data protection law actually is, is the one that is used all around the world, because that's the only way you can get your products into the European Union. And if we use it to really, because we are talking about interests now, to really push our interests on human rights, on social standards, and on climate, these trade deals, because we have this economic power, then I think that's our strongest tool to shape the world in the way that we want to see it change. And maybe that's the reason why the European Parliament uh, put on ice the comprehensive agreement on investment with uh, the People's Republic. We also have a question on the People's Republic. Like uh, in the chat, Klaus Pompas is asking, if we want democracy to prevail, how long can we afford in Germany to rely on our wealth uh, on exports to the People's Republic of China, um, which will definitely try to destroy Western model of democracy? Alexander Kulitz, Germany's interest vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, what, what is the priority from a liberal perspective? Well, to answer the question of Klaus Pompas, I mean, let's be very honest. Um, Every system, no matter whether it's a democracy or any or a monarchy or any other system, it only prevails as long as the promise of prosperity to its people is actually working. And that's what worked very well in Europe, because economy is one of our forces. And we have managed so far to give prosperity to the whole of Europe, to all the member states and to all of our people. And of course, on the other side, there's a completely different system and a very challenging system, the Chinese system. But one thing they also managed to do is to give prosperity to their people. So this is why even looking at China, I think that's why the challenge is so big. If you compare it to earlier times, we had different systems competing, the Soviet system, et cetera. They didn't manage at some point to give that prosperity promise to their people anymore. And that's when a system started to tumble. That's when systems started to break down. So the question is, and, um, and Hannah is absolutely right. We have a, 
a, a small ten we have a tendency or we are dependent on the Chinese market and we've seen that during the COVID crisis without China and our cars being sold in China the German cars being sold in China the crisis in Germany would be much bigger much larger so what can we do as politicians and what's the political task to change this dependency for one it's a free market so it's up to the companies to decide who where they want to invest where they want to go whom they want to deal with but they have to know there's a huge risk if they do it with china and probably us as politicians we can help a lot in setting the framework so focusing much more on the asean countries looking at indonesia nobody talks about it i mean we all know about india it's a huge market it's a very complicated market a very complicated country but we focus so much on china without taking care of all the other things that are happening. So I'm very much looking, and I think we're also going to discuss that later on, on a transatlantic um, relation and what is happening next week when Joe Biden is going to be here for six days. I mean, that's, that's a huge, huge impact that might bring. If we manage to get along in the Western kind of hemisphere, and if we manage to get our powers back together, and um, otherwise, you can't change, you can't, in a relationship, you can't change the other. You can only change yourself. That's, uh, that's the truth. I I, I thank you. I've seen uh, Norbert Röttgen shake his head when it comes to dependence on China. I will come to that in a, in a second. But just one question, up or down, um, Alexander Kulitz, the comprehensive agreement on with China, good thing or bad thing? I was happy that we at least got some um, something going and uh, negotiation is always good. Negotiation is always better than not doing something, than not doing nothing. Okay, that's the glass half full theory. Uh, Norbert Röttgen, are we dependent on China when it comes to... No, I do not share this view uh, that there is a one-sided dependency of Germany from China. Uh, I would see it uh, the other way, that we, are, that we are successfully trading with China and that this is a significant uh, uh, a proportion of our overall uh, trade and that there are uh, several strategic sectors of the German industry for which China is a very important, perhaps a market of existential importance, yes. But it's 7-8% seven, seven, of our overall trading we are doing and the, the trade volume with China is immediately followed by the trade with which we have with the Netherlands. So this shows also some proportionality in doing trade with China. But it is the truth is that China is um, perhaps not dependent, I would say close to dependent, very key uh, in acquiring uh, uh, German technological industrial know-how. So what we have with China, and this is quite exclusively within Europe and in the West, including the United States, we have a balanced economic trade relationship with China. And this is a good thing economically for Germany and for our relationship. However, the change is also coming into this relationship because it's not enough any longer to perceive China only and mainly as a huge market for German industrial products. This has been our China, the German-China policy for decades, successfully so. But China has changed. Xi Jinping is a different sort of a politician. And now China Im imposes the most fundamental, comprehensive challenge to the international order. And to this, we have to give an answer, which is more than doing trade with China. I think the main answer is that we have to increase our strengths, that we should not uh, backtrack uh, and withdraw from China and take a position that we are in the future only doing trade with democracies. It would be a very, very small portion of trade we would have then. It's, it's illusionary and it's not, I would say, uh, uh, limiting or stopping trade uh, with China. But what is essential is that we take on the uh, comprehensive, fundamental competition. China is determined to impose to the rest of the world and to world order as we have seen and developed after the Second World War. And for so this, we, we have to create new approaches, new alliances. I think we have to bring together Europe. I would argue for a transatlantic policy where Germany with its 
important, significant, successful trade with China can also bring in and shape the substance of a transatlantic policy vis-a-vis -vis China, which would not be marked by hostility, but by strength and cooperation. This would be my approach. Thank you. We've, we've already uh, slipped into my second issue of challenges. You've, you've called it a challenge, the challenge from an authoritarian state like China, um, uh, the challenge of, of democratic societies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these uh, functioning systems or successful systems, uh, comparing it with the, with the Cold War. Um, I'll uh, go over to Neil Schmidt, um, also because Norbert Röttgen brought in the United States. Uh, in the United States, the discussion is quite clear. It, it's all about China. Uh, Europe is only an after thought and how it can work uh, when it comes to this global competition uh, with China. Um, where is the SPD's position on this? Um, because uh, also historically the Cold War uh, an analogy was, was drawn, um, the SPD was uh, trying to find a third way between the two superpowers. Um, is this something that you would also try to find between uh, in a confrontation between the United States and China? Um, well, I agree with Norbert Röttgen that the major challenge is the rise of China. And in so far, we are in sync with uh, what uh, is debated in Washington and in the US. Um, and there's also a very clear attitude, I think, of all major German parties of the Democratic Center that we do not have to choose between the US and China because we have already chosen or we chose uh, 50 years ago when uh, the when West Germany joined NATO and the European uh, community. So in terms of values, of value systems, of systems of governance, this is crystal clear. Um, and uh, there can be no po policy of equidistance or whatever you may call it. Um, in terms of interests, there might be some divergences. So when it comes to trade, when it comes to security policy, um, we have to talk to our American friends about the world as one world and not only China. Just take the Middle East. Some weeks ago, we have witnessed the comeback of a very old conflict, the Israel-Palestine conflict. And we cannot just short of shove it off the table. It's there. And we don't have there. to deal with that. And, and so I believe that, yes, there's a huge opportunity now with the Biden administration to define a common uh, China policy in many respects. Um, but we also have to convince our American friends that there are some other conflicts out there in the world and they cannot just shy away from that. that they, if they want to be strong and if they want to have play a strong role on the world stage, they cannot only talk about China. We have to talk more about China, we have to do more in common about China uh, and there there should be a division of labor between the US and the European Union. So we should care more for our immediate neighborhood, including the Middle East, the post-Soviet space, Africa. We should also support the US efforts in terms of Indo-Pacific strategy. But to be very frank, sending a frigate, a German frigate to the Indo-Pacific is fine. Uh, but in military terms, we cannot do much more even if we increase our defense budget to two or three or four percent of GDP, um, this will not make a huge difference. But we can this do will, more. This will also, certainly, to, this will also certainly not happen uh, even under the next government. So, so let's but be we have, realistic. We, have, we will have to do more, not only in military terms, but in political, economic terms when it comes to the post-Soviet space. So take yeah. Ukraine. Well, we let, let, me, let, me pass this, let me pass this on because that's very, that, that's very useful and that's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned a number of other conflicts that Europe should take care of um, in, in conjunction with the, Europe, uh, with the United States. Hannah Neumann, um, what are the challenges uh, that the European Union should take care of, security or otherwise, in its neighborhood? 
Well, for me, the bigger challenge at the moment is to get the European Union as the European Union to take care of any of these challenges, to be frank. So before I'm telling you which one we should tackle first, I think we need to, to be the European Union tackling only one. And anonymity is one debate, but it's a symbolic debate. There are a number of areas on which we could make decisions, on which we could work together, on which we could be much stronger as the European Union where we don't need anonymity, for example, when it comes to human rights issues. But sometimes when we have anonymity on certain issues, we have individual EU member states who undermine European, and I give you an example in the minute, and I have like 100, um, where individual member states, because of their puppet pet politics, basically undermine European decisions um, and thereby just counteract to, to what the European Union could have as an impact internationally. And, and just one example, because it's one that, that bothered me a lot in the last year. We had a Berlin process for peace, a Berlin process for the situation in Libya. We all came together that we want to have a peace, where, where we want this to lead to a peace process, and we will send um, some ships into the Mediterranean to enforce the arms embargo against Libya. While we sent these ships, we had the first discussion that some member states didn't want this ship to go to certain areas because it could happen that it picks up migrants. So we already limited where the ship could go. Then member states didn't send enough ships and not enough surveillance. For example, Italy, they send one plane every, every other week for one day. So that's like the capacity challenge. So we want to have this and then we don't send the capacities. Then the next thing is we have France supporting Haftar with weapons and we have Italy supporting the Libyan government with weapons and we all together as European unions are still doing maintenance for the A400M military plane in Turkey that clearly violates according to the UN panel of experts the arms embargo in Libya. I mean how on earth could the European Union play a role in any of these conflicts if that is the setup that we have at the moment and I could give you examples of so many other countries but that for me is the biggest challenge having an EU foreign policy. To, very much to the point, how on earth are the Greens going to change that if they come to the government in Berlin after the uh, fall election? Well, I don't think we, we are going to change that in a week. Um, okay. Not even the Greens can change that. Not, even, week. The okay. not even the Greens. Not even the Greens are you're, going to change that in a week. You're getting modest. Okay. But, uh, I mean, we, but, but we missed out on a few things and that may give you, I mean, an idea for, for, for what we would do differently. I mean, we can debate the French way and ideas of strategic autonomy and how the European Union should act in this world. But he is the only one that constantly puts forward ideas, suggestions, concept papers, discussions, and he kind of runs into an empty void with the, with the current government in Germany. So if Germany, and a next German government with maybe, well, Greens in power, are just going to pick up this discussion and pick up these debates. And we're really going to have a proper discussion about where, where, well, where do we want to go? What do we want to reach? And not a technical one like the strategic compass. I know it has been an attempt to do that, but it ends up being another technical administrative exercise and not the big political debates. And then include, I know France and Germany are important, but we have far too long left out Italy, Spain, Poland. Um, I'm, I'm grateful you mentioned, get this started. I'm grateful you mentioned France because that, that is, is what would be my next question. Concretely, Franco-German Armaments Corporation is meant to be a stepping stone and, and an engine of European security. Well, it's not. What will happen to the joint, uh, the, to the joint tank project, to the joint fighter project, um, if it survives the current legislature, and then we have a green-led government uh, after September? What will happen to Franco-German Armaments Corporation? We as Greens don't have an issue with Franco-German Armament Corporation. We have an issue with the way it's implemented at the moment. And I think it's, by the way, an issue that for some reason we even share with the German armament industry, sometimes there are very interesting um, developments happening at the moment. Because in France, basically the state is the arms industry. So whenever we start negotiations between the French and the Germans, in, with the French, we have the arms industry sitting at the negotiation table. In Germany, we have sitting the BMVG with two very technical people who cannot decide on anything and need to run everything up and down the administration and then also talk to the arms people. And that's such an imbalance in power that we now see with the FCAS basically 
um, with the German arms industry and the German interests bought out by French. And we are not having a level playing field. And this continues if we look at the issue of arms exports, where France exports so many things to so many countries, clearly violating, for example, our European common position. When Macron says, irrelevant of his human rights record, we are going to send weapons to Sisi. I mean, th that is like publicly undermining everything we believe in just for the economic benefit of the French armament industry. So if we really go for a European defense union, and if we really go for the European procurement market, and if we really go for a level playing field, and then save billions, because we develop stuff together, not 50 times or 27 times, then the Greens will be fine with it. But the way it's working at the moment, I think it's very frustrating for many in Germany and not just the Greens. Uh, Norbert Röcken, you're in the midst of these discussions. Is it so easy? No, please allow me to, to jump in to the former point you have touched upon, and this was a question of the emergence or the probability of, a, of the emergence of a European foreign policy. When and uh, if uh, Europe is going to become a, a, a foreign policy actor. And my view, I think this is one of the most concrete and complicated uh, and due to decision uh, questions of German uh, foreign policy. And I say, I'm convinced it's not a matter uh, of uh, government change in Germany. It's not a matter of one week or one year. My view is that we are not going to see a, year, a year, EU 26, what have we are, 27 uh, European foreign policy uh, in the next four years, perhaps not in the next eight years. Uh, and we have to draw our consequences out of this. Um, the reality is that the European level of doing foreign policy, I would say, has become weaker in the last four years. That we are more uh, disunited than we have been before. Uh, and you mentioned the case, the embarrassing case of Libya, for example. Uh, 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 and it's a, it's a case in point. So the question is, what is the consequence for German foreign policy? If we share the view, we are not going to have, because we are not sufficiently united and do not have a shared idea of how to do foreign policy, what is the consequence for German foreign policy? And yes, I think this has to be answered and not only debated. I would say... What, what is the answer? Norbert Röttgen, what, what is the answer? Does it mean the answer, to, the answer to give is up that trying? We, that we nevertheless do some sort of European policy by gathering groups, of willing and able countries agreeing on a foreign policy project. The, uh, open, of course, always to all the countries, a, a, a closely aligned uh, to the EU institutions, but we should not debate, we should start doing something, because there is only one legitimacy which matters in the dire state uh, European foreign policy is, and this is legitimacy, the legitimacy by success, by results, and we need results. Okay, I thought there was also legitimacy by democratic processes, but Hannah Neumann. Yeah, hey, but but just really, no, no, but I, I just have will one not, question really not, to know yeah. about Röttgen. I mean, I totally get, so we have a group of member states that work together to push a certain policy, but what will happen, and I clearly see this coming, if another group of member states pushes forward the opposite policy. Because we will not just have one going to one direction and the others not doing anything, but we will have one group going one direction, the other one just clashing. Then we will have to manage this conflict and we would have to do everything uh, to avoid this conflict uh, to unfold, of course. Uh, it's, it's not the best proposal I could imagine theoretically. Uh, theoretically, I could imagine much more better solutions, but I'm deeply convinced that we have to stop our endless debates and have to come to action. And the only way to achieve action is by assembling countries uh, in deeds and not in debates and words. There is, 
That's that's very good. There is more than this. I want to bring in Alexander Kulitz and a question from the audience about uh, relations with the African continent, uh, in particular uh, North Africa, um, Morocco, Tunisia. Um, I recall the last time we had a liberal foreign minister. Um, he uh, he he uh, went to the region uh, immediately after uh, the uh, convulsions of the Arab Spring. Um, there was a, a lot of enthusiasm uh, towards this particular region. Um, where do we stand now? What is it that the Liberals would want to achieve in relations with the southern Mediterranean, uh, northern African continent, uh, or Africa more broadly? On that issue, it's actually a disaster. We don't stand on a very good point. But let me once again get back to the other question. I absolutely understand Norbert Redskin's point to say, okay, we have to act rather than to talk. But I actually agree with Hannah. This might also bear the risk of separating Europe even more. And one of the main issues, and I think we've already touched that right at the beginning, is if you look at your, the European Union from the outside, it always seems like the council is a second chamber, like a Senate or something. It's not. It's actually the core of the power in Europe. But if we're being very honest, the council is nothing else but an assembly of national interests. So if we have not a majority vote on the council, if we don't have the possibilities within the council to really decide in, on, as, on a European level, we actually only have two European bodies, which is the Parliament and the Commission. But if we don't manage to transfer some of the foreign policy decisions at some point back to these European institutions, no chance of keeping the European Union together, and especially not as long as the foreign policy questions are still national uh, questions, whereas trade already is a European question. So we really have to tackle on, on, on that point. And I, I agree with Norbert Röttgen, it's better doing something than talking about it, but we cannot risk separating the 27 countries within the European Union by building blocks within. That's what China and others are only waiting for, for us to really um, disagree within, our, within the community. So that's a huge risk. Um, Morocco, honestly, I don't get it. I, probably people don't know, but they withdrawn even the ambassador to Germany, which is probably the worst time to do so. We are in the bridge of, of changing our administration. So that's really when we need to get back on the table, where we need to talk. And at the moment, we don't even have anybody from Morocco in, within Germany. I never got the, the I never got the reason why really Morocco withdrew. I mean, okay, they, they were they weren't very happy with our decisions, but it was probably the worst thing to do is to withdraw the ambassador. Um, and if you look at the other countries at the moment in the Northern African region, um, sometimes I have the feeling we tend to block it out a little bit because what happened there is it's one disaster after the other. And um, how can we manage it? And to be honest, it's not Germany can't. We can only do it together. Once again, it's a question we have to solve within Europe. And once again, we have the problem. If you look at Morocco, Algeria, we have different interests within the European Union when it comes to different countries in North Africa. So how are we to tackle that? And if we look at the German government, once again, if you look at Africa, we have three different strategies at the moment from three different ministries. So what's if we don't manage to consolidate on a European level our African strategy, we're going to end up in a disaster and we're not going to help anybody. Okay. Um, let Nils, me, if you want to come in. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me submit uh, two modest proposals how to proceed on the path towards a more uniform European foreign policy. One is to focus on fields uh, in which the European Union has well-defined competences. So, foreign policy is also trade policy, is investment policy. And if you look back at the debates of the last two years, most the, 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 the best success stories of European policy making um, were linked to fields of um, uh, EU or union competences. So we have now the proposal on investment screening, we have the proposal on um, uh, an instrument for tackling the issue of public procurement and all these, uh, all these matters are also part of a comprehensive foreign policy approach and are a first step uh, in our response to the China challenge. And the second um, proposal, the second way forward for me, is a closer and more frank uh, German Frank, uh, French uh, cooperation. So, we, if we want to succeed in EU foreign policy, 
we need the famous um, German-French tandem work well. And we need to debate things out with our French friends. So for too many years, we let North Africa be treated and dealt with by France and the Balkans were up for, and Eastern Europe was up for Germany. And uh, I believe that the conflict, uh, the German-Franco um, dispute over Turkey in the last few months, or the debate on uh, Europeans, on the European um, operations in the Sahel, proved to us that we need a, a broad debate on every important foreign policy issue with our French partners, regardless of what the historical interests, the cultural ties, whatsoever are. So we need to we need to debate more about Africa and Western Africa, and the the French need to uh, debate more about northern Macedonia and Albania. We're and coming we back. To, we need to confront. To... We need to confront our opposing or diverging views on that in a very frank matter. And there's one format. I think the point is, that. is. Let me just finish that. There's one format where we can do that. That is the French German Security Council, which does not really fulfill this role. Okay. Thank you. No, no, that's a very concrete proposal. And we're coming back to procedures, it seems, whether the EU can agree on a common foreign policy position, whether German ministries can agree on a, on a common position, uh, whether Germany needs a federal security council, um, or uh, how we, we debate with uh, the French partners. Um, I want to raise one more issue, one challenge that was also mentioned in uh, the chat, um, and that's global health. Um, the question about how has the pandemic changed perceptions of global health? Um, how, for example, the, the vaccine strategy or the IP issues, the intellectual property, the patent issues around uh, uh, the vaccination, um, how will they change maybe policy making also at uh, the Germany level or how can a country like Germany um, uh, impact on this? Uh, Norbert Röttgen, um, the government has been um, how can I say, careful in uh, welcoming the, the U.S. proposition um, to, uh, to um, raise or to, to lift the patents uh, for vaccinations. Um, how does that fit into a bigger picture of global health policy, which Germany has been so vocal about? Now, yeah, I think this, is, this fits quite well because our conviction very fundamentally is that uh, the protection of intellectual property is a, a major and fundamental incentive for research, for investment, and uh, the, 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 the uh, certainty that you have the protection if you do the investment and uh, have the results of innovation, then uh, you are granted uh, that this right is not uh, encroached on. Of course, licenses are a different thing, but to lift the patents uh, uh, I think, in, in our view, is not a good uh, way of uh, encouraging innovation. So I think it was more a tactical move by the U.S. administration, which was really not very engaged in exporting uh, 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 American uh, vaccines or in any way engaging internationally. And by making such a proposal, I think it was a more it was a tactical PR move and not a serious proposal how to get the United States involved. Um, but uh, come September, how, how would uh, Germany, how should Germany uh, continue on, on this, this global effort uh, to, uh, to beat the pandemic um, beyond, up, above and beyond what is done at the national or the European level? Because with the variants, the mutations uh, coming along, we all realize uh, that this is not going to go away anytime soon. Yes. And, and so I, I do not honestly see much change. Everybody has understood from the start, of course, that this is a global, it's a pandemic. Uh, and so we are only safe uh, if and when the world is safe. So it's our interest to do that. And uh, everybody uh, with a rational sense will engage uh, in, in spreading and, and distributing vaccines uh, globally. The question, was 
uh, is there a, an order of time? So we start with our own country, with our nation, and uh, then there comes um, a second uh, level of, of, of countries where we export uh, vaccines. I think this was the lesson we have learned, that there is a, uh, that there is a relationship between citizens and the state, that there is a desire and demand to be protected, uh, and that this also affects a, the, the acceptance and legitimacy of, of institutions and the state on the one side. And on the other side, uh, everybody feels the international responsibility and the rationale that you can't fight a pandemic but only fighting it locally or nationally. Uh, and the third thing we have experienced, so I, I'm not very convinced that we have learned so far very much out of this uh, pandemic, is that we have seen that the, the, the new paradigm of systemic competition, power competition, has also poisoned and uh, impacted the vaccination policy. We have seen uh, um, uh, the masks uh, diplomacy by China, uh, we have seen uh, the, vaccine, the fight against the pandemic be made as a part of the systemic superiority of uh, the Chinese system and so on. So also, so we have learned that even such a challenge and such a danger pandemic which affects mankind was not uh, a, a, a threat and danger enough to contain uh, and suppress uh, the power ambitions, but uh, contrary to that, it was made a part of a power strategy. There is still a lot to do, and maybe we need to change the system a little bit. Um, two, more, two more questions before we wrap up. Hannah Neumann, um, uh, you are the one uh, of the European parliamentarians um, that established the term security. Um, women in international security, if you look at the G7 foreign ministers meeting in London, um, seven men standing around the chairs, um, if you invite all the foreign policy spokespersons of the German Bundestag, you end up with an all-male panel, which we did not tonight but because of you. Um, what is the, the programmatic change that needs to be done in foreign policy? I think we really need to make it our aim that, to include the diversity that is in the world out there. And I'm not just talking about women. I'm talking about civil society organizations. I'm talking about people of color that could be different people of color in different settings into the foreign and security policy. Because especially in countries where we talk about war and peace and the transition from war to peace, I mean, these are key decisions for society. And if we don't manage to bring the diversity of the society that these solutions and these peace deals or whatever need to work for to the negotiation table and to the discussions, I think, well, we lose out a lot. And in theory, we know all that for 20 years now, but somehow in practice, you mentioned the G7. Um, I look, for example, at the, at the Libya peace process or at other peace processes. We, we are really, I mean, slowly, if at all, moving ahead on this issue. And here we need, well, really a paradigm shift. And, I'm glad to see that increasingly also men become our allies in this one. And that's why I see that maybe things will be changing soon. And we need a, well, a female German foreign minister, of course. Um, which may uh, even happen. Um, uh, bringing in voices, uh, I have different to voices. Protest. <laughs> <laughs> Protest uh, noted. Um, uh, bringing in voices, uh, bringing in citizens uh, into uh, foreign policy discussions has been an issue recently in Germany. There was a citizens' assembly um, that discussed Germany's role in the world. Alexander Kulitz, the Liberal Party, um, claims to speak for citizens. What is the role of, of citizens in foreign policy from your perspective? I hope it's not only us claiming to speak for citizens. I hope that's the idea of democracy. So all of the parties hopefully have this, for sure. um, at least. Um, um, <clears throat> of course, it does make sense. But the problem is also when it comes to foreign policies, as we already discussed at this panel, it's sometimes so complicated and there's so many nuances on it. So to have a discussion, you really need an educated base to do so. And uh, that really, that's where the think tanks come in. That's why it's so very important. And let me also put uh, the big thank you on this panel to the Hertie School, but also to the Open Society and all the others 
That's where we get a lot of information. That's what we need. We need the basis to have an educated, um, to, to really discuss those topics on an educated basis. And uh, that's probably one of the main issues. If we discuss it completely with, social, uh, with the civil societies, there will be a lot more input, which is very important from different parts. But the problem is if media takes over on one or the other side, then the discussion might not be objective on the, on the long run. So we need to engage much more with civil societies to get a clear understanding, also to get an educated basis within the society on what is happening. But we very much have to prevent that it is kind of captured by one or the other ideology or one or the other idea. Foreign policies will not work if it's only against or for somebody. Foreign policies always needs to really much look at the closer and the, the, the reasons behind, which might be cultural, which might be um, ideological. There might be many reasons. And uh, that's where I see, or that's why I'm a little skeptical. If, um, if you manage to get society in, but you don't manage to get the educated basis on the, on, on the topics. That's where it becomes dangerous because we've already had our experiences also in history. It's very easy to get parts of the society only believing in wrong and right or only believing in one side or the other. And that's what you really have to pay attention at on foreign affairs policies because foreign affairs is way too complicated to just simply paint it in black and white. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether foreign policy is more complicated than uh, finance uh, policy or, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the pensions policy. Uh, at least to me, it looks much more difficult, these other topics that I don't have to deal with. Either way, um, uh, Alexander Kulitz has already started to thank the organizers, which is for me the sign uh, to close this discussion, to hand over to Daniela Schwarzer for some concluding thoughts, thanking you again, uh, the speakers, all of you, for your uh, interview interventions and also the audience for coming in with questions, comments. The chat was very lively and we uh, at least could tackle some of those questions. Daniela, over to you. Thank you very much, Cornelius. Thank you to all speakers. It was fascinating listening to you. Um, and maybe, Cornelius, I'll pick up one of your last remarks, and that was on whether foreign policy is actually a complicated policy area. And I think if, if this evening ma made one thing clear, if we think about it as external relations and we look at all the policy areas we just touched upon as being part of foreign policy, but also in a wider sense, trade, finance and all the others, I think uh, what we realized and this discussion showed it, it's not about diplomacy only anymore. It's not about the own sort of the traditional approach to foreign policy anymore. It's really a broad set of challenges. And we heard on many occasions tonight when several actors like China, like Russia, and so on were mentioned how they weaponize some of the tools that we from a german perspective or even from a european one wouldn't traditionally see in the field of foreign policy how they use it against us for goals that we would attribute to their foreign policy mainly winning in a power game for instance so i think that is something that we take uh, have to take very seriously and when germany thinks about its uh, setup of the next government and the structures it puts in place not only for forward analysis, but also for quick reactivity and the ability to shape. Um, this, this context, in my view, is really the, the fundament uh, for, for us to do this. Um, I just want to highlight the trade-off, which I found most interesting tonight, where we had the most back and forth, and I think it is one of the crucial ones going forward. And this is Germany's place in Europe and whether we drive an all 27 approach going forward or whether we rather lean back, look at the realistic setup of very different interests and they are going further and further apart. As we know, polarization is growing, normative conflict is growing within the European Union. So can we still stick to our traditional approach and hold the EU 27 together or are we going into the direction of rather looking at smaller groups moving forward? Of course, there are examples where this has worked and hasn't really damaged the European Union. If you take the Normandy format, if you take uh, the involvement of, at the time, the UK, France, and Germany, and the JCPOA, the Iran deal. However, there's, of course, a danger. Um, and I think this is one of the, the big, big decisions that Germany will have to make, whether it continues to play this role in the European Union of bringing East and West and now North and South and Northeast and South, which are polarized along different lines, uh, whether that's the prime objective to hold the club together or whether on some issues we may want to push for, further with smaller groups. We have said little about the UK tonight, but I would always include them in the mix when it is about big foreign policy challenges. So I'll leave it there. And I just wish to thank you, Cornelius, for 
uh, moderating this debate, which was very lively and I enjoyed listening to it. And I wish to thank all panelists and the Hattie School for having set this up with us. So have a very nice evening, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night.